What's up, guys? Welcome to another three-hand edition of You Comment, We Respond. All January. All January. We are starting with This Play Takes Guts, which happened in the heads-up portion of EPT Prague, or as Jonathan likes to call it, Prague, for some reason. Probably because <laughs> no! he's a cultured man from worldly I've stuff. been around. I'm just going to around. That. If you want to see our breakdown of that hand, click right there, then come back here for your comments. Yes. Here are our favorite comments, or at least two of them, All right. that we're going to get into. Alex Kloss. Frequent, frequent uh, tweeter. He and retweets all of our stuff. We love that. We appreciate that. Yeah. Is Meyer only representing the jack of spades when he moves in on the river? From Suzor's perspective, he's only losing to three cards, the eight, nine, or jack of spades. So if that is what he's representing, I kind of find it baffling to fold a potential chop. It's extremely hard to put someone on an exact card. Plus, you guys mentioned that there's a decent chance Meyer checks the river with it to bluff catch. Frankly, I think that Meyer can have any two cards because any bluffs he has would bet the flop check the turn because he thinks he can't get Suzor to fold when he calls the flop, and then move in on the river because Suzor hardly ever has those spades in his range. Your thoughts? The thing is, it's just so much worse when you're wrong yeah. than it is good when you're right. Right. If you're a Suzor here. You just get to chop if you're right. If you're wrong, the tournament's over and you just got second place money. Right. And remember, because you're chopping, there's you only win four and a half million, but the move in is for like six and a half million. Yeah. So we're actually losing more than we would win every time. I do agree that I don't think Meyer is betting any of his spades here that play, which is the 8, 9, or jack of spades. I think he's actually checking all of them, if or he, he should. If he's legitimately 100% of the time, then yes, of course we have to call. But we can't say with certainty right. that he's going to check those 100% of the time. He actually might move in with the jack of spades specifically. And maybe because there's five spades on the board, you, you're moving in to hope to get the chop sometimes, or the guy calling for the chop? Maybe. 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 There's some arguments to think that sometimes Meyer could move in with spades here. Yeah. We came to the conclusion that it would be suboptimal to do so. Yeah, we think it is. But we thought it mattered more that Meyer assumes Suzor really doesn't have spades that often and he's the guy with the big stack so he can bully Suzor. That's what happened and it sucks to get bullied but the thing is calling for a chop even though this guy is intentionally putting you in this spot is still terrible. Yeah. If you remember when Scotty Wynn won the World Series of Poker main event and who doesn't? Yeah. Right? He said, you know, you make this call it's all over baby and the guy called playing the board because he just thought Scotty was goofing around. Scotty yeah. was not goofing around and it was over right away. Right. He was calling for a chop, not pretty. It's no. so much better to call when you think the guy's bluffing and you get to win the whole pot right. and actually hurt your opponent yeah. and help yourself instead of just get back to break even. Although Meyer's story didn't make a ton of sense, did not. he did a great job of putting Suzor in an awful spot. Yeah. It just feels terrible to be in that spot. Honestly, doing either thing, calling or folding, sucks. Yes, absolutely. All right, moving on, Dead Money C says, you use the term playing for his tournament life, which indeed we did. Yes. When people use that term, meaning that it should somehow influence the decision, it makes me crazy. Then he wrote short walk. I don't know what that means, but we're gonna find I out. I think it means like a shorter version of what he would usually say. Okay, maybe. Yeah. In my opinion, the only time getting knocked out of a tournament should affect your decision is when you're at the final table and there's a really short stack at the table and there is a big pay jump involved and maybe not even then. You should just play your hand optimally and not worry about getting knocked out. I believe in the adage the guy with the cigar used to say about poker, you can't live if you're scared to die. That's Amir Vahidi, and I think actually what he said was, um, to live you have to be willing to die, but close enough. Very close. Then he wrote PH, PFHTL, I don't know what that means, maybe there's swear Fittle, words in there. Fittle. Yeah, heads up, whatever. That makes me crazy, okay crazier, PS, good play, not elite. Right. Okay, fair enough on that last part. Probably Absolutely. just a good play, not yeah. a lead play. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, we, we, you know. We, we oversold it. We use hyperbole sometimes. Sue us. What are you going to do? Yeah, bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Hellmuth. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, okay, so what do you think about this? Okay, so I disagree to some extent here, right? So when we talk about tournament life, I agree overall. The notion of playing your cards optimally is probably correct, mostly. Yeah. But tournaments do differ from cash games, and it's important to recognize that. Of course. And there are spots in the tournament where you have to play tighter than you otherwise would have to do, and that's just how it is. That's just how it is. And of course, heads up, there is no ICM. Right. But it's a big difference if Meyer's the guy who's all in versus him putting Suzor all in. Yeah. That changes this play dramatically because it ends the tournament versus not ending the tournament. And that is a factor. It's crazy to think it's not. Right, and yeah. you know, making a call where you can only lose the tournament, you can't win the tournament, like Grant's yeah. saying, and there's, you know, $400,000 or 400,000 euros in this case difference 
you know, that's a big jump. Yeah. And that should at least play into your thinking a little bit. If I was playing one cent, two cent, I would call Grant. Right. If we're playing for 400K, I think for a long time and probably fold. You think know? about it like this for a second. Meyer cannot possibly lose the tournament on this hand. Suzor can. That's a big point of leverage. Yeah. So there is something to be said for playing optimally. And in fact, a lot of the best players, I think, often play optimally in the yeah. face of this. Right. Which is great. But even the best players, there are spots, and actually you, you allude to this, you know, that they will sometimes change their play based on the situation. Right. I'm thinking about there was one like super high roller event where Mike McDonald had a blind and a half. I think two right. other players yes. also, Paul Newey had a half a blind. Yeah. Someone else had a blind. Paul Newey moves in and Mike McDonald had one blind and king queen in middle position yeah. and did not know what to do because right. the bubble was so big. I think yeah. he called. It was a 200K bubble. I think yeah. he called. I think I thought it was incorrect yeah. to call there because Newey's going to get Because Paul Newey's so going to get the small blind and the big blind to call no matter what. Right. Yeah. So, so. there's a good chance he's going to go out. So even though you could, but if Mike McDowell doesn't care about the money jump. He cares. He agonized over it. Of course he cares. <laughs> yeah. But I'm saying, but if you're playing optimally, maybe we decide not to care about the money jump. Yeah. Because we're trying to win the tournament, right? Right. But the truth is most of the time you're not going to win the tournament no matter what you do here, right? Yeah. You have one blind and it's like $200,000 if you fold something like 66% of the time, maybe more. That's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Our next hand features famed sex tape star Rick Solomon. Yeah, as most of our hands do. <laughs> Not him, but a sex tape star. Yeah, of some sort or yeah. another. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and who else? Christoph Vogelsang is also in this. And it's from the one drop. It's called Million Dollar Implosion. Because it was a million dollar buy-in. It sure was. Check right up there. If you want to watch the hand, please do. Because we're going to be referring to lots of things that happen. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> I, I crushed that. Yeah. Masticlox Poker. That is a cool name. Masticlox. It sounds like a Pokemon, maybe. A Masticlox? Yeah. I don't know. I was thinking, like, your master... It doesn't matter. Okay. Why can't he have seven deuces, seven five? We must be talking about Vogel saying. Yes. He is in the big blind. He, yes. He can't fold pre-flop. Or he would fold Solomon's raise with seven deuce, seven five. I don't think so. There is an ace on the flop, so we can hope for some chops. In worst case scenario, Solomon has a seven with his bad kicker, depending on the cards that will run out. And if Solomon is crazy enough to have bluffs in that spot, usually this kind of players might play an ace that way too, unlikely though. So he can add a bit of bluffs and maybe an ace. So you're saying he can have a bit of bluffs on the river? Solomon? No, we're talking Vogelsang? about Vogelsang the whole way. I don't know how Vogelsang can ever have any bluffs Vogelsang on the river. Vogelsang can't have an ace the whole way, right. and he can't have a bluff on the river. And so. he would never, ever move in on the river with seven deuce to seven five. He would no. just call. Actually, seven five becomes a full house on oh, the river. Oh, does it? Okay, so he. So it's possible that he would move in with that? He might move in it's with that. It's actually kind of borderline. It's close. Based on how Solomon played the hand, where he raised bets, bets on a seven seven ace board. I don't think Vogelsang is ever moving in with king, uh, king nine, right? No. So just, so seven, oh, sorry, king seven. Really, it'd be crazy to move yeah. with King 9. No, yeah, that would be insane. <laughs> King but, 7. But King, yeah, Trip 7's with the best kicker. I don't think can move in on the river. Uh, the bottom full house at least should strongly consider it. Could, could Should consider it. But still, Vogelsang never is moving in with what he assumes is a chop against 7's hoping for a chop. No way. You know, it's just not happening. Guys, because Rick Solomon, first of all, is Rick Solomon, he's probably not going to fold. Yeah. Number one, as we see, he calls almost instantly with his no kicker yeah. hand. His hand that's never, ever good. Never yeah. good in a million years, yeah. Um, so it, you just wouldn't expect that. It's just it's just a crazy suicidal play. He's not doing it in a million dollar buy-in. He's probably not doing it in a much smaller buy-in either. Right. You know, that's not what, most pros don't play like that. I feel like Rick Solomon must have had the thought that this guy had that maybe Vogelsang has an ace for some reason and is deciding that he can somehow get value from I that. I don't think that's what happened. That's not, I mean, that's not possible, I obviously. think it, uh, watching Rick Solomon's reaction to the all-in was like, oh, gosh, oh, I'm probably beat. Oh, yeah. I'm getting a really good price. Oh, you know what? I have a big hand. I'm just going to call. Yeah, Rick Solomon decided the price was too good, which I can understand that feeling, certainly. But if you really take a step back and think about it, Vogelsang is not doing this with a chop. He's not doing this right. with another seven that's chopping with you, and he's certainly not doing it with a worse hand. I agree. So, I will say this. I will say this. If you're Rick Solomon... There's got to be some overall value, not in this hand, but overall as a strategy to not fold really good hands against pros almost no matter what they do. Because right. sometimes they may take weird shots at him and things sure, like sure. that. So maybe that for sort of factored into it as well. He called way too quickly. He probably should not. He shouldn't play the hand like this. No, it was bad. All right, moving on. Tonkington1 says, how does this hand play differently if Vogel saying as Vogel saying, if you have any of the non-boat 7x hands. Oh, here we go. Does okay. King 7 play differently to 7 deuce? I think I'm calling down with both given Vogel saying is relatively short. So, yeah, we agree. We agree. He's probably calling down. I mean, yeah, he's probably going to call with 7 deuce. 
on the river, but it's actually kind of close. I mean, if you call the turn, you're sort of like stuck Seven on the Deuce river, is a very you? uncomfortable spot. I think King Seven you can't really get away from because you're beating all the Sevens that aren't boats. We could decide if we have Seven Deuce that maybe Rick Solomon's crazy enough himself to have an ace. I mean, no, we can't. I don't know. It's Rick Solomon. I don't know what he's got. He's going to raise an ace on the flop? I mean, it's terrible, but... And he... then bet once we call? <laughs> I mean, he should never do that. Come on, man. Nothing makes sense. Yeah. Rick Solomon shouldn't have played anything I think but se- a full house like this. I think the seven chops for Vogelsang are actually difficult spots against Solomon's line here. I think King Seven is a pretty clear call just because of your dist- distribution. You beat all the chops. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, you have to call yeah. King Seven. And you lose sometimes, but you just right. have to call. Okay. Finally... Uh, Kfry749 says, frequent watcher, first time commentator. All right, cool. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you to, for your comment. You say Vogelsang. Isn't it Vogelsang? I yeah. don't know. I don't know either. Vogelsang it is. You say Vogelsang has to have at least a seven here, and I agree. So far, okay. so good. But you don't seem to think Solomon knows that. Yeah. Yeah. If he realizes on the turn that Vogelsang has to at least have a seven, he should realize he's chopping at best. Yep. On the turn, he is chopping at best. Yep. His, uh, his card does not play. I know he should have seen this earlier, but once he gets there, doesn't the river bet make sense as a bluff if he can only win the pot by betting? Weird sizing maybe, but is it at all possible that Solomon, tr- Solomon turned his seven into a bluff here, hoping to fold out a seven? I know he won't fold out a seven, but can he fold out king seven to do seven here? Well, there's, a, there's a problem with this line of thinking. Okay. You know what it is? Go ahead. Solomon doesn't just bet the river. He calls a raise. He calls the all-in. Yeah. So he's not just bluffing, right? Right. And That's also, it's kind of crazy to turn this hand into a bluff, it's right? too strong to turn yeah. into a bluff. And you can't really expect better hands to fold ever. Maybe, maybe if Vogelsang is playing hyper tight, you can fold out a chop. Like I said, Maybe. it's a it's a bit of a tough spot. I would I think that's asking too much of. It is asking all too much, but like in the last comment, what I said is it's it is a tough spot with Vogel saying if you have a seven chop type hand, but if you have a seven that plays at all seven ten or better, I don't think you're folding. You just have to call. Yeah. You just have to call, and I think you're calling with all sevens. Yeah. I think you're just it's uncomfortable, and you're calling with all sevens anyway. Right. But thank you for the comment, and it's a yeah. it's a cool thing to explore. Absolutely. But I don't think that's going to really work as a bluff too often. Right. All right, the final or ultimate hand of you come out, we respond, which is a way cooler way to say final. I don't obviously. know why you didn't start that way. The ultimate hand this time is can a net find a fold, which is really one of my favorite hands that we've done recently. I hmm. really like this hand. Really? I think it's really cool oh. where a net does find a fold in yes. a tough, tricky spot in a cash game where she overbets the river. If you want to see that hand, click right up there. Here's the comments. All right. Yeah. Kareem King says, theoretically speaking, do you guys think bluffing ace of spades 10x and king of spades 10x are doing the job in this exact spot? Doing the job? Yeah, I assume getting a net to fold. Getting it, well, obviously they would because <laughs> she did fold. Right, right. So, um, so I think if you're going to have some bluffs here, those are the two best bluffs to have because although having a 10 is a good enough bluff catcher in itself I that mean, you probably shouldn't turn it into a that's bluff. That's the thing. Yeah, Isn't that's it? the issue. Turning a 10 into a bluff is a big proposition especially when you're going to give such a price to a net i would want the board to be a little straightier or something yeah for us to do this or maybe an another spade comes off something where um it's harder for us to believe trip tens can be good here right but it is a cool thought that it if, is if you think based on our nets line she usually has a flush for some reason if yeah. that's what you think okay and you decide okay what is the best blocker hand in the world it's ace of spades with a 10. No question. Because you block enough flush and you block all the boats. It's that's just great. so strong. But that's like a really complex play, and it's something that you would usually just call with. Yeah, and also, once she bets 30,000 on the river, we might be afraid we can't get her to fold. Yeah, absolutely. Because Does, it doesn't really look like she can based on our stack size. Right, right. Now, she does, Yeah. which is a credit to her. Right, and it, I guess that's a problem for her if Justin Smith had this play in him. Yeah. Where he's like, I guess this just isn't good enough. Trip 10s isn't good enough against the Nets line here. I have to I have to bluff because I have the ultimate blockers. Right. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Diginification okay. says, you guys just doing what Polk does now? That's Doug Polk, <laughs> of course. I prefer your analysis. Thank you. Thanks. Because he seems hell-bent on not giving away all the secrets to thinking about game theory. But beyond that, don't do hands he already did. 
Uh, well, we don't have full control over which hands we do, first of all. Right. These are suggested on Twitter. People want these hands to be done. They're then, then voted on by our patrons on Patreon. Right. So this was voted on and chosen. Also, there's a lot of good poker hands out there, but there's not infinity good poker hands out there. And if there's a good hand, we're just going to do it. We're not going to avoid hands that anybody else has ever talked about in the past. Right. Sorry, that's just not going to happen. I mean, Doug Polk's certainly done hands and will do hands that we've already done. I'm sure it's going to go vice versa as well. It's just the way of the world because there's some great poker hands and we're not gonna, as Grant said, avoid analyzing a great poker hand. By the way, we're told anyway, because we haven't seen this video by Doug, that we came to different conclusions, as we seem to often we, do. We sometimes do, and isn't that yeah. kind of cool as a viewer to see two different perspectives yeah. on something? Isn't that a little bit better even than seeing different hands? Yeah, or just yeah. our perspective, that's right. okay too. <laughs> anyway, finally, Floor says, Frequent commenter. Yes. Yeah. What's going on? Last podcast on January 4th, which is a week ago right. from when he wrote this. Right. Okay. Fair enough. What we've done for January is we've gone to three videos a week and two podcasts a week. It's admittedly a little confusing. It's a for bit you guys. confusing. We're trying to get the schedule figured out here, but sometimes the podcast will fall on Monday and Wednesday, sometimes Monday and Friday, sometimes Wednesday and Friday. Right. From now on, what we're going to do is on Monday, we're going to tweet out and tell you when the podcasts are coming out so that's more clear. Yeah. But we appreciate that you care enough about the podcast yeah. as well as the video to be like, what is going on with the right. poker guys? So we had that confluence of events where it just happened to be a week difference because it was Monday, Wednesday, then Wednesday, Friday. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So it looks like, oh my gosh, there's nothing. And by the way, I guess this video must have come out just before the podcast yeah. today uh, on Wednesday, which right. is when we're shooting this. So that means it looked like it's been a week and yeah. a half. Oh, the poker guys are just not doing podcasts anymore. No, we're still doing it. Two we're a week. Doing two a week, you know, th through the end of January at a minimum. Hyper in-depth podcasts, if you don't already listen to them, yeah. listen to them. You got to check it out. Yeah, check it out. 